Before Marvel made an interconnected cinematic universe on film and TV, Star Trek did it first. From the first episode of Star Trek The Original Series in 1966 up until the last episode of Enterprise in 2005, the Star Trek canon consisted of five TV series, one animated series, and ten feature films, all of which were interconnected and which spanned several starships and crews over the course of 200 years. But that was then. Such interconnectivity is no longer possible. Over the past decade, we have gotten three rebooted feature films set in another universe and a TV series which does not share continuity with the recent movies because producers proclaim it to be a direct prequel to the original Star Trek series, despite not lining up with it in any way, shape, or form. Behind this drastic change are complex rights issues. These have been referenced by both the media and people involved with the production, but their details and implications have hitherto not been fully explored. That is about to change. In this video, we will break down these rights and licensing issues, their repercussions, and the key people for better or for worse associated with them. To do so, we will first recap the history of rights transfers for new viewers, and how the Star Trek rights were split, rendering the kind of interconnectivity we saw in the past impossible for the future. Then, we'll cover how the current state of Star Trek on film and TV is the result of an alternate Star Trek license, what this implies for the traditional Star Trek canon, and finally, if there is a way forward where canon can be preserved. Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry had worked on the concept behind what would become Star Trek, which was pitched as Wagon Train to the Stars since 1960. In 1964, after being rejected by numerous other production companies, Roddenberry won over Herb Solo, a producer working for Desi Lu, the production company founded by Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball. By this time, however, the pair were divorced. Arnaz had been bought out, and the day-to-day -day operations of Desi Lu were, by and large, managed by Lucille Ball's second husband, Gary Morton. Herb Salo convinced Morton and Lucille Ball that Star Trek was worth pursuing, and the deal was made. Salo would continue to oversee development of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. Desi Liu had a right of first refusal deal with CBS, and as such, CBS was the first network that was offered to produce Star Trek. But CBS wouldn't become part of Star Trek history until much later, because at this time they summarily rejected this offer, opting instead to pursue Irvin Allen's family-oriented Lost in Space rather than Roddenberry's more cerebral Star Trek. For Desilu and Roddenberry, being rejected by CBS was but a temporary setback. As is well known, NBC would eventually pick up Star Trek, although they had to commission not just one, but two pilots before deciding to commit to a full series. The first episode of Star Trek The Man Trap was broadcast on NBC on September 8, 1966. NBC, however, only had the domestic first-run broadcast rights and no ownership beyond that. The end credits listed Star Trek as a Desilu production in association with Norway Corporation. Norway Corporation had no relation to the country of Norway, but it was in fact Gene Roddenberry's production company, which is a fancy way of saying his tax shelter. The actual production company and Star Trek's original ultimate owner was at this time Desilu, but times were about to change. In the mid-1960s, many different mom and pop production companies such as Desi Liu were bought up by major corporations for reasons ranging from wanting their catalog to wanting the real estate where the offices were situated. On July 27th of 1967, while the second season of Star Trek the original series was in production, Lucille Ball sold Desi Liu and Star Trek with it to the Gulf and Western Corporation. Gulf and Western were at this time already the corporate owners of Paramount and they had no intention of keeping both Desi Liu and Paramount as separate entities when costs could be cut by absorbing one into the other. Within a few months of the Desi Liu acquisition, Gulf and Western had restructured Desi Liu into becoming part of Paramount Television under Paramount. The ultimate owner of Star Trek was now Paramount, while Paramount was in turn owned by Gulf and Western. As such, the third season of the original Star Trek was produced by Paramount. The series was famously cancelled after that due to the inadequate rating system of the time. Star Trek would, however, go on to find new life in syndication, where it would be discovered by more fans than ever saw the series during its original run. Fan demand for more Star Trek sparked the first batch of Star Trek merchandise, however questionable it might have been as well as the first conventions. The demand for more Star Trek even led to the short-lived animated revival series by Filmation. After that, Star Trek merchandise reached a whole new level. Paramount did not yet fully realize the potential inherent in the brand, and they certainly made mistakes managing both it and the surrounding merchandise. The rights situation, however, was clear-cut. Paramount was the sole rights owner, and as such, made the final decision over whatever happened to Star Trek on both the big and small screen. 
as well as in books, comics, and all other merchandise. When fan demand combined with the success of Star Wars convinced them that continuing Star Trek on film might be a more worthwhile pursuit than another TV series, that was their call to make. And when they later decided to bring new Star Trek to TV and have it interconnect with the movies, nothing prevented that. Even if mistakes were made on their watch, Paramount did enough right with the Star Trek franchise and its interconnected canon that it would become one of their prime assets. While the Star Wars movies had bigger budgets, were more commercial and more accessible to a wider audience, the more cerebral Star Trek was still a money printing machine in its own right. Rather than trying to be Star Wars, Paramount at that time recognized where Star Trek fit in the entertainment landscape. They recognized the appeal it had to its audience and they embraced what made it unique. In doing so, they turned Star Trek into a lucrative and more importantly, a reliable property, one that any other studio would have killed to have. Star Trek generated multiple income streams for Paramount from several different markets. On the small screen, Star Trek yielded massive profits for its owners, not just through syndicated reruns of the original series, but also through syndicating the contemporary series, first and foremost, The Next Generation. Star Trek was extremely popular with its sizable fan base, and this in turn made Star Trek extremely popular with licensees. Third-party manufacturers of merchandise such as toys, models, apparel, comics, and other assorted collectibles. Despite some major missed opportunities, this licensing revenue alone became a considerable income stream for Paramount. Finally, there were the movies on the big screen. While they never came close to Star Wars money, they were nonetheless reliable earners in that they performed well given their medium budgets. Also, every time a new movie was released, the revenue generated by both merchandise and the past catalog would spike. By 1994, Paramount's corporate owner, Gulf & Western, had been restructured and renamed as Paramount Communications. Paramount Communications and Paramount Pictures with it was sold to the Viacom Corporation. The Viacom Corporation in turn was owned by National Amusements, which functions as both a theater company and a holding company, at the time controlled by Sumner Redstone. Born on May 27, 1923 in Boston, Massachusetts, Sumner Redstone graduated from Harvard Law School in 1947. He practiced law until he entered the family business, National Amusements, in 1954. Twelve years later, in 1967, he would become the CEO of the company. In 1979, when he was 55 years old, Sumner Redstone was sleeping in Boston's Copley Plaza when the hotel caught fire in the middle of the night. According to Redstone's autobiography, A Passion to Win, he smelled smoke and discovered that the corridor was ablaze by way of opening the door to it. The flames shot in and set both the room and him on fire. While in flames, he made it to the window, but the ground was three stories down, so jumping was not an option. Instead, he clambered onto a tiny ledge outside, waiting for the fire department to arrive, while the flames shot out the window, charring him. Redstone survived, but with third-degree burns over 45% of his body. Doctors were unsure if he would ever regain full use of his legs, but after months of surgeries and rehabilitation, Sumner Redstone was able to walk out of the Massachusetts General Hospital Burn Center, which today is named after him, thanks to considerable donations over the years. Redstone would return to the business and continue to expand the national amusements empire through a series of acquisitions, including the hostile takeover of Viacom in 1987. In 1994, Viacom would take over Paramount, which also included at the time Madison Square Garden Properties, the New York Knicks and the New York Rangers, and Radio City Music Hall. Despite the change in corporate ownership, Paramount was still the owner of Star Trek and continued to operate the brand much in the same way as in the preceding years. Over the next few years, Paramount's new corporate owner, Viacom, was picking up ever more companies. In 1999, they bought CBS, the very same broadcaster that had rejected Star Trek when it was offered to them more than three decades earlier. In 1999, when CBS was bought by Viacom, the president and chief executive officer at CBS Television was Leslie Moonves. Following his graduation from Bucknell University in 1971, Leslie Moonves initially pursued a career in acting, landing a few bit parts in such series as Canon and The Six Million Dollar Man. He also worked in casting before switching to the business side of the entertainment industry. In this area, he would excel. Moonves would work at various executive positions at 20th Century Fox, Lorimar Television, and Warner Brothers Television before joining CBS in 1995. Moonves was the executive who greenlit the series Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, ER, Friends, along with a slew of CSI series. He also personally cast Dean Cain, Terry Hatcher, George Clooney, and Jennifer Aniston 
and a whole host of others in the roles they are most widely known for. Les Moonves reportedly had a great working relationship with his ultimate boss, Sumner Redstone. In 2003, Moonves was promoted to chairman and CEO of CBS, who would go from strength to strength under his leadership. His leadership, however, did not include much in the way of science fiction. To the contrary, Moonves famously harbors a strong dislike of most anything with sci-fi elements. Reportedly, he did not know the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek. His one and only contribution of note to Star Trek at this time was making the call to cancel Star Trek Enterprise towards the end of its fourth season. Outside of the network's responsibilities being configured in such a way that Moonves was in a position where he could end 18 consecutive years of Paramount's Star Trek on TV, CBS actually had very little to do with Paramount, the other media company owned by Viacom. Despite having the same corporate owner and some cross-pollination because of it, there was very little connection between CBS and Paramount. As time went on, the two companies would continue to evolve in very different directions. This inspired Viacom owner Sumner Redstone to make a radical decision. The media landscape is ever-changing. By 2006, Sumner Redstone decided that the two main media assets in his Viacom portfolio, Paramount and CBS, had evolved into distinctly different companies. Therefore, both would be better served if they belonged to different corporations. As such, he decided to split Viacom into two. It was a controversial decision even at that time, where other corporations like Disney and Time Warner picked up several companies in different industries to keep them all under the same corporate ownership. Redstone went against the flow by splitting up the owning top-level corporate entity to better reflect what the underlying companies were doing. As such, the Viacom Corporation, the ultimate owner of both CBS and Paramount, which we from here on out will refer to as the old Viacom Corporation, was restructured to better serve CBS. To this end, the old Viacom Corporation was renamed the CBS Corporation. But remodeling the old Viacom into the modern CBS Corporation was only half of the equation. The other half was that Paramount was moved wholesale away from the old Viacom, now the CBS Corporation, and under the ownership of a new formed corporate entity, which recycled the name of the corporation that spawned it, Viacom. Or as we will refer to it from now on, the new Viacom. Where there previously had been only the old Viacom, there were now two different corporations, CBS and the new Viacom. While Sumner Redstone was the majority shareholder of both by way of national amusements, the two newly formed corporations both operated in different markets, had different managements, and different corporate goals. For Star Trek, this corporate split would have major repercussions. The Star Trek rights could be traced in a direct line from Desilu to Paramount, Paramount and therefore Star Trek were ultimately owned by the old Viacom. In the corporate split, however, Paramount was separated from its corporate owner, the old Viacom. But it was the old Viacom, not Paramount, that retained custody of the Star Trek rights. The old Viacom became the CBS Corporation, and that is how Star Trek suddenly ended up under CBS's ownership. Star Trek was now under the stewardship of CBS executives that never had anything to do with Star Trek before. Paramount, on the other hand, the company that actually made Star Trek the golden goose that it was, were only allowed to keep the rights to the 10 Star Trek feature films made directly under their wing. They weren't just deprived of not only the highly lucrative Star Trek licensing revenue, but also their ability to make any new Star Trek in any format. CBS were now the only ones who could do that. If Paramount wanted to make any new Star Trek, they had to get a license to do so from CBS, same as any other licensee. For the first time in the franchise's storied history, and as the result of a self-inflicted corporate divorce, Star Trek was subject to rights issues. CBS, as the new Star Trek rights holders, now had the legal ability to make more interconnected Star Trek on both the big and small screen, if they so wished. However, they had no interest in doing so. No one with any influence in CBS really understood what Star Trek was as they hadn't been involved with it before, nor had they any experience firsthand in the kind of revenue the brand could generate if treated properly. They could have learned if there was any motivation for them to do so. But under the regime of Les Moonves, who had been promoted to CEO of the newly renamed CBS Corporation in the split, there wasn't any. CBS did just fine without Star Trek before, and they would continue to do so after. Outside of keeping the Star Trek catalog and licensing revenue still flowing, Moonves had no room for any new Star Trek in his plans for CBS going forward. While CBS could make more Star Trek but didn't want to, Paramount wanted to but couldn't. Paramount was hurting at the box office at this time and in need of more franchises. 
Star Trek, the family heirloom that was taken from them in the Viacom split, started looking awfully tempting after Sumner Redstone fired Tom Cruise for his public buffoonery. And I do it the way I do everything. <laughs> There's nothing part of the way for me. <laughs> and thereby ended even the Mission Impossible franchise for the foreseeable future. Mission Impossible 3 director J.J. Abrams and his production company Bad Robot were Paramount's golden boys though. After some convincing of Star Trek's transmedia potential and allegedly being offered a stake in Paramount Star Trek they could not refuse, J.J. and Bad Robot signed on and Paramount arranged a license to make new Star Trek movies from CBS. Please note that everything we have gone through so far is easily verifiable public information. We are now entering the realm of rights and licensing agreements between CBS and Paramount where the details have not been disclosed to the public. However, multiple people in both companies with access to this information have come forward with it. And there are multiple cases of public statements and actions that are consistent with the information that is about to be revealed. However, since the information isn't independently verifiable at this stage, we must advise you to consider it a rumor. Paramount didn't want to revive Star Trek for the box office receipts alone, but to get the previously discussed revenue stream generated by Star Trek licensing flowing again. While CBS did not value Star Trek enough to pursue any more installments of it, they did value the steady stream of revenue that licensed Star Trek merchandise generated, and they were not willing to share any of it with Paramount. Now, technically a corporate enemy, albeit one that had the same majority shareholder as them. The solution was to issue Paramount with an alternate Star Trek copyright, which they had to pay extra handsomely for. What they essentially did was to license the creation of an alternative Star Trek, one which visually and tonally was legally required to differ from the original Star Trek enough that the two could be separately licensed for third-party merchandise. This way, CBS would get to keep all licensing revenue based on the likenesses of all ships, uniforms, characters, and designs of the original canon Star Trek, made up to and including Star Trek Enterprise while Paramount would get to keep all licensing revenue based on the ships, uniforms, characters, and designs associated with their alternate Star Trek, which would begin with the 2009 movie. How different do they have to be in order to be separately licensed? The frequently quoted figure is 25% different. We will get back to this figure and its origin in due course. Regardless of how this figure is quantified, the difference manifests itself in different ways. Tonally, the canon Star Trek is slow-paced, reasonably grounded science fiction, while the alternate Star Trek is fast-paced and leans more towards fantasy. The ship designs are more complicated and far bigger in the alternate Star Trek than they ever were in the original canon. To borrow a phrase from Red Letter Media, the characters themselves are electrified. In all the incarnations of the original Star Trek, the uniforms were solid-colored cloth, while the uniforms in the alternate Star Trek are partially watermarked with raised Starfleet Deltas. The one exception is the uniform scene in Star Trek Beyond. On that movie, it was allegedly director Justin Lin and screenwriter Simon Pegg that for creative reasons wanted to get closer to the look and feel of the original series. To this end, an additional agreement with CBS was reached, which allowed them to use uniforms of solid color cloth, but in order to qualify as sufficiently different that they could be further licensed to third parties, they had to feature metal badges and metal insignia, another hallmark of the alternate license. Anything from the original canon Star Trek can be separately licensed for use in the alternate Star Trek, but Paramount and Bad Robot do not have resale rights to it, meaning they cannot monetize it by in turn licensing it to a third party. And that licensing revenue is one of the major motivations behind pursuing Star Trek in the first place. One example is the Tribble in Star Trek Into Darkness. Paramount could separately license it and put it in the movie, but only CBS could sell it and profit from cuddly Tribble toys. As such, Paramount and Bad Robot had very little incentive to put anything from the original Star Trek canon, now owned by CBS, into their alternate Star Trek. In addition to being given the license to make an alternate Star Trek, CBS also reportedly agreed that they would not put out any competing Star Trek for a decade while Paramount built their brand. This was an easy agreement for them to make, as not only did Paramount pay a fortune for it, under Moonves, CBS weren't going to make any more Star Trek anyway. It is also heavily rumored that both parties agreed to remain silent about the fact that Paramount's alternate Star Trek is not part of the canon Star Trek, so as not to delegitimize it for the built-in audience. The biggest problem for Paramount and Bad Robot, though, 
would turn out to be their own mismanagement of the property. As we have covered before, the merchandise based on their alternate license did not sell as expected, and the Kelvin timeline was for all intents and purposes scrapped with the cancellation of Star Trek IV. But Paramount's alternate Star Trek did not begin and end with the Kelvin timeline. On the contrary, that was but one of a myriad of possible timelines within the alternate Star Trek license, as we will explore later. With J.J. Abrams' 2009 reboot, two new terms were introduced to the Star Trek vocabulary, the Prime and Kelvin timelines. Audiences were told and presented with charts which showed that the Prime timeline refers to the original Star Trek canon, while the Kelvin timeline refers to the alternate timeline of the parallel universe which was created when Nero and Spock Prime went back in time in the intro of the 2009 movie. To make that point clear, Paramount and Bad Robot's incarnation of Star Trek does not operate under the Back to the Future rules of time travel, where history is overwritten, but instead it adheres to the multiverse theory, where countless parallel universes exist, and any changes resulting from time travel simply leads to the creation of another timeline in a new parallel universe. Case in point, audiences were initially told that the universe of the Kelvin timeline movies was the same as the prime timeline up until the emergence of the Narada, although this was later retconned to that the destruction of the Kelvin altered that entire parallel universe from beginning to end. The retconned version is more in line with the right situation, as nothing seen in the Kelvin timeline movies has been made under the original CBS Star Trek license, not even the scenes taking place in the prime timeline. That takes us to the crux of the matter. The audience has been conditioned to believe that the prime timeline is identical with the original canon Star Trek from the original series, up to and including Enterprise. This belief, however, is not entirely accurate. For the moment, ignore the different timelines and their names. These are only distractions from the bigger issue, which is that there are ultimately only two different incarnations of Star Trek. One is the original Star Trek license owned by CBS. This consists of all Star Trek released from 1966 up to 2005. Let's call this Star Trek canon. The other is the alternate Star Trek license to Paramount and Bad Robot. Within this alternate Star Trek license, Paramount and Bad Robot can make as many different incarnations as they want. They can feature whichever characters they want, and they can explore whichever time frames they want. The most important requirement is that in order for Paramount and Bad Robot to be able to monetize it, whatever they feature must deviate from Star Trek canon by the contractually specified figure, which is believed to be 25%. With these two legally separate incarnations of Star Trek established, let us get back to the issue of timelines. Obviously, the Kelvin timeline is a product of the alternate Star Trek. What may be less obvious is that the Prime timeline is also a product of the alternate Star Trek. Star Trek canon was never referred to as Prime until the release of the 2009 Star Trek movie. That was when Paramount and Bad Robot coined the term. Contrary to what you have been conditioned to believe, Prime does not actually refer to the actual Star Trek canon but rather the alternate Star Trek's representation of Star Trek canon. In order to be monetized, this representation also has to be 25% different from actual Star Trek canon. Case in point, everything from the prime timeline in the 2009 movie, including the USS Kelvin and its crew, as well as Leonard Nimoy's character, Spock Prime, and the storyline about how a supernova destroyed the Romulan homeworld in his native universe, are products of the alternate Star Trek and can be monetized by Paramount and Bad Robot, not CBS, the owners of Star Trek canon. The very terms Prime and Kelvin were invented not so much to keep track of the different continuities, but as a means to legitimize Paramount's alternate Star Trek as a parallel universe to the original Star Trek canon, rather than the completely separate entity that it legally is. To this end, the comic book prequel Countdown, co-written by Alex Kurtzman, was intended to bridge the gap between the Prime and Kelvin universes, although both are products of the alternate license, not the original Star Trek canon. It doesn't matter that the Kelvin timeline is done on film, that was but one timeline. Under their alternate Star Trek license, Paramount and Bad Robot can create as many different universes and continuities as they want, as long as they differ from the original Star Trek canon in accordance with their agreement with CBS. Since the Prime timeline is also a product of the alternate Star Trek, they can even set future movies and a TV series in it, which is precisely what they did with Star Trek Discovery. The entertainment landscape is ever-changing, and by 2017 the switch to digital streaming was in progress, with many networks and corporations wanting to launch their own streaming services. To this end, CBS launched CBS All Access. While Les Moonves had never cared for Star Trek before, 
it started to look like a suitable property to exploit and serve as a means to an end for promoting CBS All Access. From what we have been told by people with knowledge of the situation, Discovery progenitor and original showrunner Brian Fuller did intend for his vision of Discovery to be part of actual Star Trek canon under the original CBS license. However, due to a variety of legal issues and subsequent deal-making between Moonves and Paramount that was outside of Fuller's control, Discovery had to be made under the alternate Paramount license. Since it was Bad Robot that ran Paramount's Star Trek operation and J.J. Abrams had already jumped the Star Trek ship, it was Alex Kurtzman and his Bad Robot team that were brought over to CBS to oversee development of Star Trek Discovery, now under his ironically named production company, Secret Hideout. We brought in a lot of the same people who worked on the movies to be working on the television show. For Moonves, this was an easy deal to accept. Paramount's involvement meant less CBS personnel being locked up with Discovery. Paramount would take on some of the risk, while CBS would continue to get any and all revenue of the merchandise based on the original Star Trek canon, and most importantly, they would still get the material to promote CBS All Access, which was just about the only thing about Star Trek that Moonves was interested in. For Discovery, this meant lining up with the original Star Trek canon was no longer a priority. On the contrary, only the aspects of the show that are sufficiently different from canon can be monetized. Since it is made under Paramount's alternate license, they could have set the series in the Kelvin timeline if they had wanted to. But in order to avoid creative pitfalls with the movies, as well as to win back some of the older fans turned off by them, the decision was made to set Discovery in the Prime timeline, which you will recall is the alternate Star Trek's representation of Star Trek canon, but not actual Star Trek canon. What this means is that despite technically being Prime, Star Trek Discovery does not have to line up with the canon of Star Trek. For Fuller, this meant he lost control over the series to Kurtzman and Moonves, who had a very different vision for the series than he did. The conflict over the look and direction of Discovery was resolved by Fuller being fired and Kurtzman and Moonves getting their way. Their way included going overboard with the redesigns, or as some would say, overdesigns, on ships, creatures, and uniforms. All told, the redesigns were sometimes taken much further than the alleged 25% different from canon, which was a requirement of the alternate license. This 25% figure, by the way, comes directly from John Eaves, one of the designers on Star Trek Discovery. Commenting on why the Enterprise that appears in Star Trek Discovery is three times as big and visually different from the original series Enterprise, Eaves stated that, the task started with the guideline that the Enterprise for Discovery had to be 25% different. And Eves continued, After Enterprise, properties of Star Trek ownership changed hands and was divided. So what was able to cross TV shows up to that point changed, and a lot of the crossover was no longer allowed. That is why when J.J. Abrams' movie came along, everything had to be different. The alternate universe concept was what really made that movie happen in a way as to not cross the new boundaries and give Trek a new footing to continue. These statements are in no way ambiguous. And Eve's description of the situation is consistent with how the right situation has been explained to us, which we are in the process of relaying to you. This is information, however, that neither CBS, Paramount, nor their production arm Bad Robot wants to become public knowledge. As that might delegitimize the Kelvin Timeline movies, Star Trek Discovery, and all future Trek made under Paramount's alternate license, which at the time of making this video is literally all planned upcoming Star Trek series. After these comments were first published on comicbook.com, a CBS representative reached out to them and interjected that the designer actually behind the changes had it all wrong and that the design changes were creative, not legal in nature. The article was updated accordingly and a lot of time was spent explaining why Eves was wrong. Here it should be noted that comicbook.com is owned by CBS. Despite this attempt at damage limitation, they were still left with the problem that the Discovery Enterprise is in fact three times as big as the original series Enterprise, which makes it more difficult to sell the notion that these two are somehow supposed to be the same ship. Eves wasn't the only one from the production team that revealed a little bit more than intended. Speaking at the WonderCon Star Trek Discovery panel a couple of weeks earlier, production designer Tamara Deverell explained how they approached the design for the show, saying, For the Enterprise, we based it initially off of the original series. We were really drawing a lot of our materials from that, and then we particularly went to more of the Star Trek movies, which is a little bit fatter, a little bit bigger. Overall, I think we expanded the length of it to be within the world of our Discovery, which is bigger, so we did cheat it as a larger ship. VFX supervisor Jason Zimmerman followed that up by saying, There were a lot of conversations and more emails than I could remember about how the design would evolve and sort of, quote, match our universe. What they are effectively saying is that this is a different enterprise set in another universe than the original series. 
In order to try to make this go away, an image of the original Canon Enterprise featuring the original length was separately licensed and displayed on a background screen in an image that was released to the public by way of the CBS-owned comicbook.com. But in addition to the redesign of the Enterprise for Star Trek Discovery, there are multiple other lines of on-screen evidence which suggests that Discovery has more in common with the alternate Star Trek than with the original canon. While anything that appeared in the original Star Trek canon cannot appear in Discovery without being separately licensed, and even that can't be monetized, the Discovery team, which is the bad robot team under another name, can pick and choose whatever they want from the Kelvin Timeline movies, since Star Trek Discovery is made under the same alternate license as them. This is why the Discovery uniforms contain the same raised Starfleet Delta watermarking as the Kelvin uniforms. In Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery, we are introduced to Captain Christopher Pike and the rest of the crew of the Starship Enterprise. Their uniforms are slightly altered versions of the uniforms from Star Trek Beyond. Discovery also features many of the same designers that worked on the Kelvin movies. One example is Neville Page, that designed the Klingons for Star Trek Into Darkness and then redesigned the Kelvin Klingons into the Klingons seen on Star Trek Discovery, where he serves as an alien designer. Meanwhile, both the Star Trek Discovery-style Klingons and the new Star Trek Discovery aliens, the Kelpians, have appeared in the Kelvin line of Star Trek comics, which again are part of the alternate Star Trek copyright. In order to explain the obvious departure from the Star Trek canon, as well as the equally obvious similarity to the Kelvin movies, the party line, Star Trek Discovery is a visual reboot, but it's still prime, is a recurring favorite among Discovery's defenders. It might be more appropriate to admit that rather than rebooting the visuals, Discovery instead recycles and refines previous visuals from Kelvin, the earlier incarnation of Paramount and Bad Robot's alternate Star Trek. Star Trek Discovery is technically prime though, but as we've seen, prime is not the same as the original canon. The same will be true for the in-development Picard series, which will also be made under the alternate Star Trek license. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Alex Kurtzman revealed that the series will feature a radically different Picard, which is a requirement of the agreement with CBS and take place in the aftermath of the destruction of the Romulan Star Empire, which was alluded to in Spock Prime's recollections in the 2009 movie, as well as in the Countdown comic, both of which were made under the alternate license. More than that, all of the different Star Trek series that have been announced by Alex Kurtzman, whether they ultimately end up seeing the light of day or not, are scheduled to be made under the alternate Star Trek license, which means they will be legally separate from the original Star Trek canon. Even so, the deliberate strategy appears to be not only to market Discovery and the upcoming series as Prime, but also increase confusion by proclaiming them to be canon. As we saw earlier, one of Paramount's stated goals with restarting the Star Trek franchise was to get the licensing revenue going again. So far, that has not worked as well as they had hoped. Audiences have a preference for merchandise based on the likenesses of the original canon, not the likenesses associated with the alternate Star Trek. Despite Paramount asking them to, CBS had no intention of stopping to license the original canon Star Trek to third parties, thereby precluding Paramount and Bad Robot Star Trek from being the only Star Trek available to consumers. It was the frustration over this very situation that caused J.J. Abrams to jump ship and take on Star Wars instead. While Paramount and Bad Robot can't prevent CBS from licensing the likenesses associated with the original canon, they can blur the lines in the public's perception of what canon is. From a legal point of view, the border between what is the traditional canon and what isn't is a clear-cut one. Everything made under the original Star Trek license is canon, and everything made under the alternate license is not. Although, the alternate Star Trek arguably has a separate canon of its own. But the legal border between the two Star Treks is one thing, the audience's perception of it is another. And that perception can be blurred. The instrument for blurring it is the same one which kicked off the 2009 movie, Parallel Universes and Alternate Timelines. Between the Kelvin Timeline, Prime Timeline and Mirror Universe, we have already seen three parallel universes on screen under the alternate Star Trek. And one of the points of featuring the Mycelial Network in Season 1 was establishing that there are countless others. This multiverse of alternate timelines and parallel universes has also been a recurring theme in the comics, which not only explicitly tie in with the Kelvin movies and Star Trek Discovery, but which Alex Kurtzman has consulted on. About Alex Kurtzman, up until recently, he ran the CBS All Access Star Trek operation as he saw fit. 
In December of 2018, however, John Van Sitters was promoted to the position of Vice President of Star Trek Brand Management at CBS. We do not know at this time the details of the working relationship between him and Kurtzman, nor do we know Van Sitter's strategy for Star Trek going forward. What we do know is that one month prior to be given this position, Van Sitter's tweeted, What if the multiverse is real and all Star Trek stories are canon? This idea was enthusiastically co-signed by Star Trek author David Galantner. This is also very much in line with Paramount and Bad Robot's alleged intentions for the future of Star Trek as it implies that the original Star Trek canon is but one timeline in an infinite multiverse. To further this perception, there are even rumors that more imagery from the original canon may be licensed for screen use further down the line, and that universe-altering events may transpire to make it appear as if the Prime Universe is going to sync up with the canon Star Trek. In the real world, of course, there is no Star Trek multiverse, only the CBS-owned canon Star Trek and the Paramount-licensed alternate Star Trek. But the alleged purpose of this would be to further the perception among the audience that all of Star Trek is really but one big canon, for the ultimate goal of legitimizing and selling more merchandise under the alternate Star Trek license. It is further rumored that the intention is for absolutely all future Star Trek incarnations from here on out to be made under the alternate Star Trek license, while the original Star Trek canon remains dormant forever. Under the reign of Les Moonves, CBS didn't just not fight this, they may have even contributed towards it. Before he was summarily fired over Me Too allegations back in the summer of 2018 and subsequently denied his severance pay, Moonves gave Kurtzman the mission to oversee Star Trek for the next five years, but it remains unknown if anything else that might have repercussions for the future of Star Trek was also agreed to. The production deal between Paramount and Bad Robot is soon coming to an end, so some speculate that Moonves might have given them, directly or indirectly, a stake in Star Trek which is not contingent upon Paramount, but we have not been able to confirm this. Regardless, these plans for the future of the franchise all rode on one thing. The alternate Star Trek had to be, at the very least, moderately successful. On the big screen, Star Trek Into Darkness underperformed, Star Trek Beyond utterly flopped, and due to a string of other flops alongside Beyond, Paramount lost their access to Chinese funding they in no small part depended upon. Without it, they were unable to secure sufficient funding to fulfill the deals they had entered into with Chris Pine and Chris Hemsworth, who walked because of it. This would contribute towards the shelving of Star Trek IV and the entire Kelvin timeline alongside it. Paramount are currently forced to undergo downsizing, layoffs, and restructuring. On the small screen, the first season of Star Trek Discovery was a free lunch, as Netflix paid so much for it, they essentially paid for the entire production. By all accounts, however, Netflix did not feel they got their money's worth and demanded heavy discounts for even signing on to a second season. This meant that from the second season onwards, CBS had to start footing most of the production costs themselves. That hurt, because no matter how many fire sales and campaigns they launched, particularly prior to season two of Discovery, audiences weren't subscribing to CBS All Access in anywhere even remotely near the numbers they had projected let alone what the service needed to to be financially successful. Success is something CBS also haven't seen too much of as of late. Outside of CBS All Access underperforming, several interim CEOs have come and gone since Moonves was ousted, and they are hemorrhaging money. CBS tried raising more cash by making and selling the short treks, but Netflix weren't willing to pay. Netflix would eventually get the short treks anyway, though, when CBS practically gave them away as a means of promoting the series in the days prior to the release of Season 2. What did Netflix do with this precious gift, you wonder? They dumped them in the Discovery trailer section without fanfare. To drum up more excitement for the release of Season 2, they repeated their strategy from when Star Trek Beyond was tracking to underperform upon its release. To help promote Beyond back then, they announced Star Trek IV, and to help promote Season 2 of Discovery, they announced the George U Section 31 spin-off series. This strategy didn't work then, and it didn't work now. Announcements are cheap unless you follow through with money. A more recent comment suggests the Georgiou spin-off will be a long way off yet, if indeed it ends up getting made at all. Worse yet, the release was marred with rumors that Discovery might already have been cancelled behind closed doors. These rumors were not helped by Pike actor Anson Mount sending a tweet which could be construed as the cast having received some less than uplifting comments about the show's future. Rumors aside, CBS are heavily promoting Star Trek Discovery as a means to an end of promoting CBS All Access. They even put the first episode up for free on YouTube, although only in the continental United States. The like-to-dislike ratio was quite unfavorable. 
It was then announced that Star Trek and the game show Let's Make a Deal hosted by Wayne Brady would cross over for the purpose of promoting Star Trek Discovery. This announcement did not stir much excitement. As a final Hail Mary pass, they took another cue from the Ghostbusters marketing handbook by arranging for the cast to appear on a late night talk show while singing about numerous Star Trek reboots and spin-offs, and how the fans are all a bunch of nerds. It would appear that they have moved away from their initial strategy of appealing to a cooler, younger crowd. With the chaos behind the scenes and a lack of interest among viewers, one can easily wonder, is there any hope for Star Trek? Depending on who you ask, Les Moonves has been described as a tough-as-nails, no-nonsense, hard-as-they-come executive who has not only risen to the top of an extremely competitive industry, but stayed at the very top of it for decades. Also depending on who you ask, Sherry Redstone is the woman that brought Moonves down. Born on April 14, 1954 in Washington, D.C., Sherry Redstone is the daughter of Sumner Redstone. A graduate from the Boston School of Law, she practiced corporate law, estate planning, and criminal law in the Boston area before joining the family business, National Amusements. Sumner Redstone was apparently not an easy man to be related to, as the relationships between him and his ex-wives, between him and his brother, and between him, his children, and his grandchildren are all reportedly strained. The relationship between him and Sherry was a particularly contentious one, though. In 2007, they had a very public feud over the running and succession of National Amusements, and subsequently of the CBS Corporation and the new Viacom. Sumner Redstone made it publicly known that he wanted his daughter out of the family business, and that in his opinion, she did not have the requisite business judgment and abilities to serve as chairman of the three companies. What she did have, though, was 20% ownership of shares in National Amusements. Sumner tried buying her out, but Sherry refused and so stayed on. Their relationship would continue to be more strained and increasingly distant for years as the aging Sumner's health declined. Sumner still liked the ladies, though. In addition to a whole host of other lovers, Sumner had two live-in girlfriends, Sidney Holland and Manuela Herza. They allegedly did everything they could to keep Sherry Redstone away from the increasingly infirmed Sumner and his business empire, which they claimed to be in keeping with his wishes. Sumner's will would eventually be changed to include Holland and Herzer as beneficiaries, and Herzer had power of attorney over his health care. However, Sherry was seemingly able to get back into her father's good graces. Towards the end of 2015, both Holland and Herzer were kicked out, and all of their powers and status as beneficiaries were revoked. Manuela Herzer would later claim that Sherry Redstone had manipulated Sumner and go on to sue her for $100 million in compensatory damages in federal court. The case was thrown out when Sumner was able to communicate that he had lost faith in Herzer and wanted Sherry to oversee his care instead. But Sumner's former living girlfriend wasn't the only one making such allegations against Sherry Redstone. Viacom CEO Philippe Dahlman and Viacom director George Abrams were part of a trust that would assume voting control of both Viacom and CBS upon Sumner Redstone's death or incapacitation. In December of 2015, Sumner Redstone, then age 92 and no longer able to clearly speak, wrote a letter in which he confirmed that it was now his intention that Sherry Redstone succeed him as non-executive chairman of both CBS and Viacom after his death. This prompted Dahlman and George Abrams to sue Sherry Redstone and state that Sherry Redstone is attempting to illegally hijack her father's well-established estate plan by removing professional managers and reportedly installing her daughter an employee and a friend who are firmly under her control. Her singular goal is to assume complete control of his businesses, despite Mr. Redstone's long-term desire for a professionally managed trust and an independent board of directors. Sherry's actions amount to an unlawful corporate takeover, and if effectuated, could have far-reaching consequences for thousands of shareholders and employees of Viacom. Just like with Hertzer's lawsuit, it was Sherry Redstone that came out victorious, while Dahlman had to resign from his positions at Viacom. Over the next few years, there would be more legal actions taken back and forth, and more allegations that Sumner's mental state precluded him from being really aware of what was going on around him, and that Sherry had taken advantage of the situation. Not a lot of useful information can be gotten out of Sumner himself, as these days, his communication is largely restricted to a custom iPad app that allows him to say, yes, no, and fuck you. No, we are not making that up. As of January 8th of 2019, Years of legal battles appear to be over. Whatever the true nature of the reconciliation between father and daughter, the legal skirmishes ended with Sherry Redstone left firmly in charge of Sumner Redstone's estate, and subsequently his power over national amusements as well as over both 
the CBS Corporation, and the new Viacom. Her intentions for both of these are well known. Undo her father's corporate split and remerge CBS and Viacom into one. Sherry Redstone was against the Viacom split since day one, and for years she has campaigned to remerge CBS and the new Viacom. The biggest obstacle preventing it has been CBS and the new Viacom themselves. Reportedly, the key people at the two companies do not like each other and have a strained working relationship. The two individuals most opposed to such a remerger were Viacom CEO Philippe Dahlman and CBS CEO Les Moonves, who blocked it at every turn. But as we saw, Dahlman was removed in the aftermath of coming out on the losing side of the power struggle against Sherry Redstone. Les Moonves continued to fight Sherry's attempts to remerge the companies, to the point where he had CBS file a class action lawsuit against National Amusements, contending that the outfit, by then run by Sherry Redstone, had breached its fiduciary duties. Two months later, it was Les Moonves that was in hot water. Six women had come forward with accusations of sexual misconduct against him. Moonves denied all allegations, which could not have come at a worse time for him. Regardless of his denials, these accusations ended with Les Moonves being ousted from CBS alongside his reported loyalists on the board. They were replaced by a new batch of board members which are said to be loyal to Sherry Redstone. One month later, CBS's lawsuit against Sherry Redstone's national amusements was settled. As terms of the settlement, Sherry couldn't pursue a CBS Viacom remerger for two years, while Moonves had to formally resign from his position. For Moonves, insult was added to injury when a report detailing the nature of his alleged sexual transgressions was widely leaked from CBS, and he was denied his severance pay. While Sherry Redstone had agreed not to pursue a CBS Viacom remerger for two years, nothing prevented the boards of the two companies to initiate a remerger earlier as long as it happens on their own accord. That may happen earlier than you think. As of a January 31st meeting, CBS were reportedly not just discussing the feasibility of a remerger with Viacom, but which other media companies to acquire after the remerger had gone through. A Viacom CBS remerger is now more likely than it has ever been before, to the point where it may just be a matter of time. That begs the question, what would such a remerger mean for Star Trek? The honest answer at this stage is that no one knows. In principle, a remerger would nullify the need for an alternate Star Trek license, as all of Star Trek would be back under one roof. In practice, however, there may be more difficulties if other stakeholders than just CBS and Paramount are involved. We do not know if Moonves gave Kurtzman or Bad Robot any other concessions when Kurtzman was given his five-year mission, but if he did, that may complicate matters further. And the Star Trek licensing deal is already complicated enough as it is. Insiders with knowledge of the situation allegedly have expressed the point of view that selling off the Star Trek brand wholesale by buying out each individual stakeholder might be easier than trying to untangle the quagmire the right situation has become. That is a last resort though. From what we hear, Sherry Redstone does consider Star Trek to be a family heirloom. As such, the more likely course of action is that the new management of a remerged CBS and Viacom will try to fix the brand as soon as it is fully theirs to fix. We shall keep you up to date as we learn more. What do you think is going to happen? And what are your thoughts on the division between the canon Star Trek and the alternative Star Trek? And most importantly, where do you think the franchise should go from here? Please share your thoughts in the comments below. If you like this video, then please click the subscribe button. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified for all the latest uploaded content. Due to recent changes to YouTube's monetization policies, We'd also like to ask you to please consider supporting Midnight's Edge and its sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark through Patreon. As thanks for their support, patrons will receive early notifications of mini documentaries, special behind the scenes making of the Edge videos, bloopers, outtakes, lost episodes, and more. You can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. Be sure to check back for news and analysis on the corporate politics behind your favorite genre movies, as well as updates and discussion here at Midnight's Edge.